This review was recorded on the 11th of May 2021, and as such any references to the date or season as refer to that. Rent a Girlfriend is one in a line of many seasonal shows that becomes beloved by the largest quarter of our anime community. It's the type like Uzaki-chan, Love is War, or last season's Jobless Reincarnation that fans take to, only to be further pushed onwards by the likes of any tubers such as Giguk, Mother's Basement, and so on. I should first clarify that by no means is that an insult. The reason shows become mainstream is because they must have some inherent value. However, as is the case with Rent a Girlfriend, not all these community darlings are up to the talk of the community. Many have flaunted this show as reigniting my love for the genre, others saying it reinvents or handles the usual harem tropes in a more adult manner. I disagree with both statements. Now for a quick spoiler free overview before we go any further. Animation and music. The artwork for the show, along with its soundtrack, are certainly serviceable but unremarkable. You're not going to find a Taradara-esque Sakuga scene hidden in this rom-com, and aside from the OP and ED, which the Peggy's do do a great job on, the OST is generally just average, sometimes dipping into the realm of irritating. Track 10 and 13 are actually painful to listen to in context. All in all, the animation isn't bad by any measure, and I could definitely see it having charm for many viewers, but I often found it to be under-detailed and overall unimpressive. And the same sentiment goes doubly so for the OST, which at its worst is downright bland. The story and characters. These don't fare much better. The designs of the characters are all great, but their personalities are one of the most overhyped elements of the show. I have little doubt this was handled better in the source material, but as it stands, the short run of the anime is far too poorly spent to give most of the cast anything to work with, and they're far from the feels oddly grounded people have labelled them. Jizuru and Kazuya certainly have more going on for them, but the entirety of the side cast is rushed and uninteresting. Mummy gets no good explanation for her actions, leaving her as just the shit stirrer archetype. Sumi features properly only in one full episode, barely. And while Ruka has an implied interesting backstory, that doesn't prevent her from being woefully underutilized. As for the rest of the cast, they're static one note characters, mainly used for comic relief which is perfectly acceptable for this breed of show, though not particularly interesting. The exception being Kibe, the best friend, though I wouldn't say he has much more to do than the others. All told, this show has two characters, Chizuru and Kazuya. Kazuya has been praised, and often lambasted, for his relatable hopeless loser personality. And while I personally think that is a good departure from the standard harem protagonist, it's by no means unique. And just having a useless male lead doesn't automatically make them great. Chizuru has found her own way to be one of those seasonal best girls, and while there is little more, a little more to her character, it really is nothing new. She's working to become an actress, and she's maybe got some compassion for her clients. Hurrah! Her character is fine but bland, and that's about as nice as I can be pre-spoiler territory. So let's wrap this short section up and move into more detail. Into Girlfriend's success, in my opinion, comes from genre fatigue. If you subject yourself to seasonal anime watching, then this show will come as a breath of fresh air, but only in comparison to other low-quality harems and isekais. The non-vocal tracks of the OST are almost laughably generic, and the artwork is just passable. The characters are wholly underserved, and the story is so plain there's nothing much to mention other than Kazuya is in college and Shizuru is a rental girlfriend. That's it. If you enjoyed this show, then more power to you, and if you're thinking of watching it for light entertainment, by all means, do so. But if you're expecting a more competently written and produced take on the genre, then you're looking in the wrong place. Many people have fallen into the trap of only ever watching newer anime in order to keep up with popular discussion. But take my advice and look back at what came before. Taradara is a harem so well written that everyone forgets it is one. Shuffle is an anime that actually questions the validity of the harem genre tropes. And School Days examines the ultimate bad end route for these make of shows. There is better out there, so even if you do enjoy Rent a Girlfriend, make an effort to broaden your anime horizons and to watch better shows. A 5 out of 10. Painfully average. Now then, spoilers up boy. With the niceties out of the way, let's talk about why this show is a garbage fire of mediocrity. At risk of strawmanning my opposition, I'll be using quotes from reviews and videos on the show, namely from the Giguk video on the topic, as it's the most popular out there to my knowledge is pretty formulaic, with a lot of shows following the same pattern, same tropes, same bland nice guy protagonist, but see Rent-A-Girlfriend is not that much different from one of those shows. But Jesus Christ, I absolutely cannot stop watching it anyway. This is where my biggest issue with the show comes from. If Rent-A-Girlfriend acted like any other harem anime, I would suggest it does a slightly above average job. 
7 out of 10 maybe. But it's this pretense that it's something more that lets it down. The show attempts to come off as a more mature by having Kazuya be a loser and having the setting be college. The problem is, just having Kazuya acknowledge his boner doesn't make this a good show by some sort of default. It actually shares this issue with Golden Time. Simply saying you're more mature because your characters have money concerns or go to university is not an excuse to be bland. What is the actual difference between this show and a high school era? In most of those, the protagonist lives conspicuously alone or with a soul sibling, you tend to get a beach episode, you regularly get girls with the harem butting heads, and by no means rare for characters to have to get part-time jobs. So where, I ask, is the big difference? It's simply in the presentation. In a standard harem, they don't attempt to hide the fact they're in their horny teenagers up to 20-somethings. But Rent a Girlfriend attempts to convince us that it's more relatable and more considerate when it follows the exact same tropes and patterns as any other one of its contemporaries. Again, to reiterate, I have no issue with a wimpy lead character, but that doesn't make it automatically better than anything else. One of the show's biggest problems is just how generic it is once you strip away the college setting. Chizuru is just too powerful a waifu. She's just the perfect blend of all other trimmings of every flavour of best girl on the market. Her design is gorgeous. People may say she's slightly tsundere, but she gets mad for perfectly reasonable and legitimate reasons, and eventually gets over them like a genuine human being. The creation has mystified many audiences, and seemingly many creators as well, who just like to crowbar these characters into their stories simply because of the popularity of the archetype without considering its narrative purpose. your protagonist will settle on the Sundere, help her through her emotional issues, and give her the love and attention she craves, and allow her space to show the sweetness in her heart which she's always guarded. Where the wires got crossed going forward from here was in the focus on the change in the girl instead of on the change in the protagonist. Instead of the guy having to change something about himself for the girl to accept him, it became that the guy can just go on being himself, and the Sundere will just eventually realize how irrational she's been for doubting him and end up going Dere. To give context here, Gigguk is referring to how Chizuru blows all the competition away, and how this is somehow a good thing. This problem relates back to my first point, but there is, to me, no more of an annoying trope from this genre than its propensity to treat girls as obstacles rather than people. It's a now time-honored tradition of anime of this nature, wherein the girl who's going to win is plastered across the opening episodes or just the OP itself, leading to all the other girls just being the version. You know exactly what I mean. Think Infinite Stratus, Nisekoi, Asterix War. Just some egregious examples. The protagonist will find his dream girl. They'll make some progress. And then a childhood friend or transfer student will hit on the MC in some way, sparking their arc whereby the actual female lead will be partially sidelined until the second girl's issue is sorted, and she can take place as a secondary character stroke fan service vehicle. It's painful. It makes for predictable writing and a pointless experience. It can work. It often does. But in shows that brand themselves as being something more, it's incredibly frustrating to see what characters could be used as plot tools and nothing more. Go and compared to her, I don't even know how there can be any competition. Oh, I stepped in shit. B what, mommy? You mean the snake in human skin? That as this quote jokingly implies, Mummy stands no chance of winning the harem. She's simply here to create conflict between Chizuru and Kazuya. For as long as she keeps meddling, Chizuru will continue to think Kazuya is taken. That's all there she's there for. Again, all the manga may go further, though from what I hear it doesn't. The anime gives her nothing to work with other than an ego and a Twitter addiction comparable to that of Fuku's main character. The quiet and shy Uguru chick, who I'm just guessing their personality because they haven't actually appeared in the anime yet. It's generally a bad sign when it takes an extra 10 episodes out of 12 to add your fifth lead, despite her prevalence in both the OP and the ED. Sumi is here as bait for her particular fetish community, which is fine if the show didn't try to pretend otherwise. Fact is, her short appearance only serves to pad out the story's runtime and to give Mami a lead on Kazuya's secret double lifestyle. There's little more to say on her in her sub-20 minutes of screen time. Oruka, who, let's be honest, had the word second place stamped on her head the moment she was introduced. Ruka comes closest to being the show's third character, but still falls short. I would suggest her purpose is to help Kazuya see what it feels like to be in a position of unrequited love, but as Gigak suggests, she's just painfully second place. They fail to actually have Kazuya realise the similarities between him and her, and while her reason for being with him due to a heart condition is interesting, 
It's poorly communicated and they don't even give her a generic I liked him because of my condition but now I love him for insert reason. Like the others, she's a victim of incredibly poorly paced 12 episodes where despite a decent screen presence, she's just used the drive another wedge between the main two duo. Chizuru herself attained best girl for supposedly being grounded and realistic. She's supposedly just sundry enough while also being dere dere enough to be realistic. I'm baffled by the people suggesting this. Yes, Chizuru does seem to actually be capable of human thought, unlike the others, but she's point blank a Sundere archetype. You've just all forgotten what that means. Her kinder side is shown once you get past her more brutal side. Sundere diagnostic is stored in air? No. Not that being a Sundere is a problem. No, the problem is what people like about her. Her being so perfect makes her boring. She's kind, intelligent, considerate to her family, a great actress in the making, where all her... where... <laughs> where are her faults? Where is her humanity? Because her violent sun side is played for laughs, you lose the point of the archetype entirely. Most harems shows endeavour to make the audience like the main girl as much as the protagonist, so that when he picks her, we feel like we know why. The classic example is Zero no Tsukaima. Louise is kind of a bitch, and uber violent. Useless at magic, and a bit more than just stuck up. But over the course of just the first 13 episodes of series 1, we see a life of being useless, looked down on and having others' expectations hoisted on her. It's more than a little justification for why she is the way she is. Furthermore, we get to see that she's noble and brave and loyal. And sure, she's quick to temper, but we're meant to understand what Saito sees in her, even if we personally wouldn't go out with her wearing a full set of body armor. In Rent a Girlfriend, there's nothing to come to like. Chizuru is a contender for the best body, best hairstyle, fashion sense, and has an almost flawless personality. She's the antithesis of a more realistic waifu. The show isn't showing you us a more realistic depiction of the harem genre. It's not like playing into its worst tropes, with three girls that don't matter and one that's too good for her own good. The girls as obstacles trope can work, but only if handled well. The point of the other girls is usually to teach the protagonist something, or for them to both develop. Alternatively, you can pull on the heartstrings of the audience by having the side girl be a tragic underdog, who we can relate to in some way. Why does Ka what does Kazuya learn in Rent a Girlfriend? That he sucks? He pretty much knows that from the word go. He fails to see himself in Ruka in any meaningful way, moves past Su Sumi like a blur, and gets over Mommy at the series halfway point. This is the worst possible case scenario for a harem. What's the point of it even being one? Why not just make it a rom-com or a love triangle? And again, I'm sure there is maybe better done in the source, but that quality leads to our last point. Victim of everything wrong with the modern anime scene. If you've read any of my other work, you may have picked up on that I dropped out of the seasonal anime cycle a while back due to burnout with the whole affair, and what a decision that was. With it gone, I can pick and choose from new shows when they're done airing and spend more time watching classics from the 2090s and beyond. It's great, and I'd recommend it for anyone. My biggest issue with seasonal washing is what me and my brother called the My Hero Academia effect, or something like that, where in a show, to its own detriment, ends inconspicuously opting to drag its story out into multiple series. Am I saying My Hero Academia started this trend? No, of course not. Multiple season anime have always been a thing, especially in the show and genre, but there have definitely been an upcake in the shows following the trend, and while some stick to traditional... Some stick to the tradition and have each series leave off with something of an ending, Quintuplets and Shield Heroes spring to mind. Many others pad out their runtime and shortchange their stories and characters in order to appeal to a hype train culture. Dr. Stone, Slimy Sakai, and so on have all followed this trend. And while I'm happy for fans of any property who get to have more seasons of the shows they love, it works terribly for an anime like Renta GF. The show has no climax, just a big to be continued hanging over it. Well, we'll never know. I feel if this show followed in the footsteps of most other high-production rom-coms, the type it seems to want to be, then a 24-26 to 26 episode run with a definitive ending would have been a much better choice. Time to properly flesh out Mommy and Rukia, and the opportunity to actually have Sumi do literally anything of worth. The point I'm getting at is while I'm happy for anyone who enjoyed this show, got caught in the hype or enjoyed the slew of mommy memes and Ruka rips, this is a bad narrative and a lackluster production. And I think the manga's fans and us as anime fans who were told this was something more deserve better. And make no mistake, I'm not one of those who takes hype too seriously. In fact, I always take it with a grain of salt. 
popular opinion is a dangerous thing, and I make a habit of, or I make a really bad habit of dying needlessly on the crosses of anime that no one likes or has ever heard of. Scoot their shuffle, the first series of Clan Adam, Full Metal Panic, etc., etc. No, I don't dislike this show because it was overhyped. I dislike it because it does have potential. I likened it earlier to Golden Time, and I'd reference that again here. This show has the space to explore traits that high school anime don't. More serious relationships with actual sexual activities. The responsibilities of being an adult. The real consequences of leading on multiple young women rather than multiple young adoring teenagers. But instead, all that is relegated to Kazuya jacking off and some vague allusions to his financial situation, which he sorted by getting an immediate job off screen. I'm afraid while I'd loved this show... Sorry. And I'm afraid while I'd love to like this show, and while I don't behest anyone who does... I doubt I'll be watching series after series of this bland story getting dragged out to its undignified extremes. Hi there. This is a shorter review I did a while back while writing my shuffle retrospective. Felt like an appropriate time to put it in as we near the end of that. And uh, it just sort of seemed like a fun one to do while messing around with my audio technology. In the case, I certainly could go more in depth, though if you've seen any of my other stuff, you'll know that a lot of this is ground I've already uh, treaded on. And I think I may have at the time been a little tired of uh, shitty seasonal anime. Whatever the case, thanks for watching. If you want to leave a like, please do, and we'll see you in the next one.